So this is going to be your guide for how to determine what attachment style my partner is. Um, and this is a question that I obviously get asked all the time. And you can use this guide in this video to determine what attachment style your partner might be or somebody you're dating or somebody you just met and are starting to see um, and might be interested in. So we'll cover all of these factors. And we'll also talk a little bit about um, some of the underlying features of each attachment style from an integrated attachment theory point of view. So if you're not already familiar, there are four main attachment styles. The first one is the securely attached style, and it is the only secure style. Um, all three other styles are insecurely attached. And the securely attached style essentially has a lot of stability in relationships. They tend to be more likely to have lasting relationships. They tend to have more harmony and less explosive arguments in relationships. They tend to feel comfortable expressing themselves, communicating openly. They tend to be really good at being there for other people, but not in a codependent way where they take on everybody's responsibilities and make them theirs, but in a healthy, stable way where they're able to give advice, give feedback, be there, but not at the expense of themselves. They make room for their own needs, their own boundaries simultaneously within the relationship dynamic. So you'll see the securely attached person. They tend to be reliable. They tend to be consistent. They tend to have harmonious, successful relationships. They tend to connect deeply to others, but they also have a strong sense of self, and they tend to have a lot more balance across the different seven areas of their life. So they will have, you know, um, a good balance in terms of their friendships, their family relationships, their, their romantic relationships. But then, um, you know, they tend to have a good balance with their career, their financial area of life, mental, emotional, spiritual, like all the different physical areas of life. They tend to have um, established habits. They won't compromise what matters to them in those areas for the sake of a relationship. They will make concessions and compromises, but they won't um, like compromise from this like perspective of at the expense of themselves. They won't sacrifice would be a better word rather than compromise. And so they tend to have a very healthy sense of self overall. So there's, you know, some early signs of whether or not somebody securely attached is are they vulnerable? Do they feel comfortable sharing? Um, do they ask you questions about yourself? Do they share a little bit about themselves as well? Not in this like intense oversharing way, but they don't mind talking about different things from their past, from their childhood, from their upbringing. Um, do they approach conflict and try to solve for it? Do they communicate openly? Do they state their needs? Do they have good boundaries? Um, and are they pretty emotionally regulated on an ongoing basis and pretty consistent and you know, healthily easy to predict. They can still be fun and spontaneous and exciting, but you won't constantly feel like there's this extreme hot and cold or confusion about their interests. So those are some like early parts of securely attached style. By the way, we have a free attachment style quiz. You can take down below if you wanna do a deep dive. Um, the next style of relationship um, is our anxious preoccupied. And our anxious preoccupied attachment style grows up in some kind of home where there's a lot of inconsistency that leads to either real or perceived abandonment. And the repetition of this over time creates these big abandonment fears for this individual at a very young age and then that extends um, you know, throughout their adult lives. So the anxious attachment style is very preoccupied um, with trying to maintain proximity and closeness to others. They really don't like distance. They tend to be really attuned to if there's any change in the pattern with their partner. And they tend to worry that this means the worst. This means abandonment, the relationship's ending, it's over, the person's gonna reject them or is no longer interested in them. And they tend to suffer from this space of always trying to people please and become good enough for somebody else. When in reality, they're actually suffering from these I am not good enough core wounds beneath the surface. From an integrated attachment theory point of view, the big core wounds or big fears, you know, core fears that the anxious preoccupied attachment style has are the fears of abandonment, being alone, being not good enough, being rejected, being unsafe, being disliked, being excluded. They tend to really get preoccupied about these sorts of things. And they tend to have high needs for connection, for closeness, for proximity, for validation, for reassurance, for certainty in relationships. So you'll notice this early on. They tend to be the ones that text all day, every day, you know, really early in a relationship. They may push for a commitment quite early on. Um, and they may become a little bit panicked or needy or call a lot or be clingy or text a lot if they see that there's some kind of distancing happening between themselves and somebody else. 
On the exact opposite side of the continuum, um, we have our dismissive avoidant. By the way, I will put a link to a course that will take you through all of the attachment cells in so much detail with like what to do to reprogram them and all these different things if you're interested that you can check out for free for seven days. I'll put a link to that down below um, if you just want to go really, really deep into that. Um, and it's probably like an hour and a half long, but it'll give you a lot more information in this video and it will also help you if you recognize yourself in this, learn what you have to do to heal. Um, so again, I'll put that link down below. But on the other side, side of this continuum, you'll see the dismissive avoidant. The dismissive avoidant usually grows up in a family where there's a lot of distance emotionally. Um, you know, really it goes so far as to be considered childhood emotional neglect. And so a lot of dismissive avoidance, even if there is a certain degree of stability in the home and there's not a lot of arguments or havoc, um, at a deeper level, the emotional attunement, the presence from the caregivers, that intimacy, that, that like, I am here for you. I see you. I'm here to connect to your needs and to know you, um, that tends to be really missing. And so as a result, this child grows up feeling kind of like they don't belong. Um, like there's this absence, you know, missing from their life. There's this kind of distance that they have between themselves and everybody else. And some of the major core wounds they will have is a lot of feelings of shame as a result of being neglected as a child. This is subconscious. They won't consciously realize this until they sort of like reflect on it. And they may realize, yeah, they do have this core wound or this fear that something is wrong with them or they are defective in some way, um, which produces strong feelings of shame. They may also really struggle to feel safe. They, they easily avoid conflict and fear conflict in relationships. Um, and they can often feel like they don't belong or they're not good enough. And they really fear being trapped, helpless, and powerless. Again, all according to integrated attachment theory. And um, when we dive deeper, they tend to have needs for independence, freedom, autonomy, um, to be understood, to be supported, to be acknowledged in their relationships, and they really want harmony and peace. And, you know, early on, dismissive avoidance, a really easy way to recognize them is that they can be charming and very charismatic, but they won't be vulnerable. Like you won't really hear them talk about their feelings or their emotions or their more personal memories. They'll have this air of kind of like this slight distance that they're always trying to keep people at that's sort of hard to break down, kind of like a nut that won't crack. Um, and so these are some early signs of the dismissive avoidant attachment style. And then last but not least, we have the fearful avoidant attachment style. And I always like to leave this one for last because they really contain both sides of the anxious and the avoidant. But essentially, the fearful avoidant tends to um, grow up with a lot more trauma, a lot more chaos in the home. Um, and so it could be that there was a bad divorce or it could be that there was, um, you know, a lot of struggles with one parent having an addiction issue or um, a personality disorder or, you know, just going through really, really challenging things. Um, or you grew up in an era or culture where there's a lot of trauma in your society, like anything where there's substantial confusion and having to walk on eggshells is most likely to create a fearful avoidant attachment style. Now, this person, when you first meet them, they'll be very charming, charismatic, very good at making you feel seen and being very present um, and making you feel like they're, you're the most special person in the world. Um, and they're very good at bonding emotionally. But if you look carefully, they're letting you bond to them, but they're usually still kind of avoiding bonding with you. And they may share vulnerable things, but not the real vulnerable things for them. And they will tend to oscillate between being hot and cold. And this is a result of them having competing associations around the same thing. In other words, they tend to think that love is a beautiful thing and a scary thing at the same time. Let's just use the example of a parent who's an alcoholic. You know, there may be this just heightened unpredictability all the time where one day the parent is loving and caring and they make you feel really seen and special. And so there's this love and, and attachment that's really nice. Um, and that's when they're drinking and they're in a really good mood. And then another day they're drinking, but now they're in a really bad mood and they're scary and they're mean and, you know, they frighten you and they say really harsh things or they do not so nice things um, or traumatizing things really. And so then that day attachment is horrifying. It's really hard and it's confusing and it's sad and it really can affect you. And then another day the parent is sobering up and they feel guilty. So they're really, really nice. And they're kind again and they're sweet, but then another day they're sobering up and they're going through withdrawals. And so they are really in a bad place and they're mean and harsh and critical and, and, you know, you can't depend on them or rely on them again. And so you have this constant, you never know what you're going to get. 
And that is the constant. And this causes a fearful avoidant to have a little more trauma when it comes to attachment, have a lot of like yearning for love and connection, but a lot of fears of it at the same time. And this translates into them being really hot and cold on and off in relationships where they're all in and then they seem to go missing or they're super present and then they're super unavailable um, or they're really loving and then they're really harsh. And it's all because of the way they were programmed um, in terms of their attachment cell and their subconscious mind. And so you'll see a lot of those early signs are a lot of um, all or nothing thinking patterns, a lot of chaos. Um, this attachment cell has the most chaos as a general rule because their nervous system is constantly making decisions from this like sympathetic nervous system state, like this fight or flight mode. And the more we make our choices from that state, the more we're going to likely have more chaos that follows us around. Um, so you'll see a lot of that dynamic. You'll see a lot of ups and downs, roller coaster relationships in their past. Um, a lot of like being very loving, but then very harsh. Um, and you'll see a lot of this, this individual like wanting love and being scared of it at the same time and you may even hear that reflected in the way they communicate about love about relationships about their expectations in a relationship overall so i have some exciting news which is that we are doing a thousand dollars off of our lifetime membership sale to the personal development school which means you get access to literally everything at PDS for your entire rest of your life essentially that entails all of our different courses you have lifetime access to I do four live webinars a week, every single week. You can access them ongoing and you get access to all of our daily community events. So I'd love to see you on the other side and you can access it by using the link in the description box below. Hopefully this makes a whole lot of sense and answered your burning questions. You can check out that link below if you want to do a bit more of an in-depth course all about um, the different attachment styles and what they are most related to and how to really understand them and recondition what's not working. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to this channel. I put literally daily videos out every single day, seven days a week for you um, to learn more about your attachment style from an integrated attachment theory point of view, your subconscious mind, your core wounds, your needs, relationships overall, so that you can grow and heal and really have the love you finally deserve in the relationship to yourself first that then translates into your relationships with others. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, subscribe and hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss any of our daily videos. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.